I'm Katie Monahan, and I'm a communications strategist here at the Ohio Arts Council, and I coordinate the OAC's webinar series. I'm a white woman with shoulder length blonde hair, and I'm wearing a black cardigan with a black and white striped shirt underneath. And behind me is a cream colored wall with framed artwork and a black bookshelf. On the screen here is a slide welcoming everyone to today's webinar, Unlocking Accessibility, Inclusive Concepts and Tools for Social Media. And the slide features an image of a hand holding a smartphone with icons for Facebook and Instagram on the smartphone screen. So we are really excited to partner with our friends at Art Possible and the Wexner Center on this presentation. But before we dive in, uh, of course, there are just a few housekeeping items to go over and then we will introduce today's presenters. So. First, everyone tuning in today is in listen only mode, but that doesn't mean you can't ask questions. If you do have a question at any point during the webinar, go ahead and drop it in that Q&A box there in your control panel. We're gonna monitor those questions throughout and hold those until the dedicated Q&A session at the end. Uh, and please be sure to use the Q&A box. It's just easier to track questions that way and we don't wanna miss anybody. Next, live captioning is available for today's webinar, and you can access those captions by clicking on the closed captioning icon in your control panel. And if you have trouble connecting or audio issues, we recommend refreshing your browser. And if that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back on. And please keep in mind that because we are presenting from various locations, there may be variations in bandwidth and internet stability. So if the sound fluctuates or someone freezes up for a minute, thank you in advance for bearing with us. I promise we will keep on rolling through those little tech glitches. And finally, we are recording today's webinar and the captioned recording will be available on our webinars page at oac.ohio.gov slash webinars and on our YouTube channel by early next week. And everyone who registered for today's webinar will also receive a follow-up email containing a copy of the slide deck and a link to the recording. All right, I think that does it for housekeeping. So now I am pleased to welcome today's presenters, Megan Feitz, Executive Director at Art Possible Ohio, and Austin Dunn, Social Media Coordinator at The Ohio State University's Wexner Center for the Arts. Megan, Austin, thank you so much for being here to share your knowledge today. I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, Katie did a wonderful job introducing us, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and self-describe for you all today. So again, I'm Megan Feitz, Executive Director of Art Possible Ohio. We are the statewide service organization for arts and disability. I'm a white woman with pink glasses. I have chin length curly brown hair, and I'm wearing a velour purple sweatshirt sitting in front of a whiteboard. Austin? Hi, everyone. My name is Austin Dunn. I am a white non-binary person with short curly hair, brown tortoiseshell glasses, and I'm wearing a blue jacket and white t-shirt today, and I'm in a kind of modern work pod. So on the screen in front of us, we've already done our introductions, but this is the agenda that we are going to be following today. First, we're going to talk a little bit about why the work that we're sharing with you is so important, and then we're going to just dig into the reasons you're all here today. We're going to talk about alt text and image descriptions. We're going to talk about social specifics. We're going to talk about language. We're going to talk about graphic design, access as a concept of aesthetic, video captioning, and older aging adults. And I am realizing as I look at these bullet prints that a few things are out of order, but you'll see them come through as we <laughs> proceed. Um, um, also on the image here, we have three very popular social media icons. We have the Facebook icon, we have the Instagram icon, and we have the X which uh, icon, which is you know formally known as Twitter. So um, as mentioned before, um, I think it's really important to outline some basic reasons why access is so essential. So I'm going to outline a few facts and principles to get us started that we believe in that support this uh, argument. So the first thing is that one in four people in the world um, identify as having disabilities. So the latest census, which was in 2020 um, for the U.S., identified that about 25% of folks in the United States um, listed themselves as having a disability. So one would assume that if you work in marketing or you're working for your social media, you're certainly thinking about your audience. And one can only presume that you would not want to just include 25% of a potential audience to come and engage with your offerings. 
The second thing I want to discuss is talking about the lack of access and why um, it's such a major problem. This problem is systemic. When we're thinking about disability, we need to be changing that and doing the hard work to think, make things more accessible for all. There's this idea that exists, um, pretty solid concept called the social model versus the medical model. The social model of disability says that disability is caused by the way society is organized. The medical model of disability says that people are disabled by their disabilities. Um, some people call them, unfortunately, pe people tend to think of them as impairments or differences. But essentially what this means is that they are disabled by their disability. So we have an image up here um, to kind of exemplify what I'm talking about today. Um, in this image, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story. Um, first I'll describe it. And the image, uh, which is a, is a round image, there are two people um, moving in front of a storefront. We kind of see a glass door behind them. And these two people are moving um, across the image, so to speak, um, towards the right side of the image. There's a taller individual wearing a gray jacket and khaki pants pushing um, an individual in a black wheelchair. That person is wearing a khaki jacket. Um, and the story of this picture is these two individuals want to get into the story. That's it. That's the story. So if we are embracing the medical model, which I already mentioned, we recognize that the reason that these folks cannot enter the store is because this individual uses a wheelchair and cannot get up that step. However, Art Possible and Austin would reject that model, instead embracing the social model, which recognizes that in fact, the reason this human cannot get into the store has nothing to do with the fact that they use a wheelchair and everything to do with the fact that there are stairs leading into the entrance and no ramp provided or second entrance that we can see. The third thing I wanna focus on today, it's really essential to recognize that disability is intersectional. And that when you're someone who identifies in multiple categories of systematic oppression, you're likely up against a brick wall. For example, someone with white skin who has a disability is still more privileged than someone with brown skin who has a disability. Understanding intersectionality is key to creating access. Finally, accessibility is not just an external problem. There are likely people you work with who need accommodations, whether they're disclosing them or not. And we must be accessible to external participants who want to be part of our programs and internal. I think I said final before, but I do have one more point. One of the things that is interesting to consider is that at any given time, anyone can develop a temporary disability and find themselves unable to access something that they had full access before developing this disability. For example, we were preparing Austin and Katie and I to present this program to you in December. Um, but right before Thanksgiving, the day before th Thanksgiving, I fell while roller skating and broke my right wrist, which is my dominant wrist, and um, had to have surgery. So I was not able to really use my laptop well, and I was pretty fuzzy headed for a long time. Um, but because Austin and Katie were so accommodating and flexible, and because the webinar series is designed to be accommodating and flexible, we were simply able to reschedule this webinar so that we could still share all this excellent information with you today. The last thing I want to say before we continue and really dig into social media is really think about who's at the table when you're creating any kind of plan, especially social media plans. Sit down at the table and consider who's there with you and who isn't. And if folks with disabilities are not at the table, we ask you to consider why not. So now we're gonna kind of dive into uh, alt text and image descriptions and what those are when we're dealing with digital platforms. So alt text and image descriptions, it's not something that is uh, solely based in social media. You can find this on websites and digital content as well. Um, and for these two descriptions, alt text is, or alternative text is going to be a short textual substitute for non-text content on web pages. These text alternatives can be read aloud or rendered as braille by assistive technology known as screen readers for users that are encountering that content. 
And when we're discussing things like image descriptions, we're going to be referring to things that give more detail than all text. They're allowing users to learn more about an image than those basic details, allowing us to kind of dive into the aspects of an image that might not be suitable within the character count that's required for all text. Um. One thing that is a really cool tool that you can start doing um, to support your organization moving forward, whether that's in marketing efforts or just internally, um, is start building self descriptions into your organization. So you probably noticed at the beginning of this presentation, Austin and I and Katie self described. Well, this is something you can also catalog in written form um, in an Excel document. Perhaps you have a kind of internal website that you use that you can have a catalog or something like that. So that when you're using images of staff or volunteers um, in your marketing materials, which does happen often, you can simply go into their profile and you can collect their own self-description to use in those marketing materials. Then you're not making any assumptions about their identity or anything like that. Um, Austin, do you want to talk a little bit about how the Wexner does that? Yeah, so at the Wex, when we have incoming exhibitions, we'll usually get photos from artists that are from other institutions of that work um, prior to them coming here for us to be able to share out and talk about the exhibition. And our exhibitions team actually works with us in comms and with the artists directly to help provide that alt text for us um, when those images are coming through. So our exhibitions team is actually asking the artist, how would you help us describe this image? And it actually creates a really great workflow because we can understand some of the cultural contexts within an image as well to provide that in an alt text. And it creates greater accuracy. And it's also teaching the artists that this is something that maybe you should think about doing for all of your art where it travels moving forward. Yeah, and if you're um, collecting headshots um, or action shots from people that you're inviting to speak at your space or people who are curating at your space or performing at your space, you can also ask them to include self-descriptions, again, so that you're not making any kind of assumption about their descriptions. It actually makes the workflow much simpler because, again, you're just copying and pasting text and popping in where it needs to be. And um, like Austin said, it's a really good best practice to follow um, and encourage those you're working with to follow so that uh, that learning is happening. Um, one thing that I've found in doing trainings like this over the years and learning more about accessibility workflows myself is that it is totally common, and I understand why, <laughs> for people to think they don't have time to pause and write alt text and write image descriptions when they're creating materials, whether on a website or for social media. And I really do understand that. I have worked in the nonprofit sector only pretty much for small nonprofits for 20 years. And I understand that time is a very valuable resource. But it's really important to start integrating in this into your kind of workflow can keeping those reasons that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation as part of your why, and then begin doing it often enough that you can't imagine creating a post without this. You really have to start shifting the way that you think about accessibility. And what that ha what happens is when you do that, um, is it starts to change the way that the neural pathways in your brain work, and it starts to alter that bias that we all have in ourselves um, when we think about disability um, and then the way the world should work. So kind of diving further into alt text and image descriptions, um, I really wanted to use this time to talk about how it's used and does social media use it. So yes, social media also uses alt text. All of our digital platforms are using alt text for our images or should be using alt text for our images. But how does that actually translate into what is appearing um, across our digital platforms? So alt text is essentially used in three facets mainly. It enables screen readers to read information uh, about on-page images. Anytime an individual is using a screen reader and they encounter an image on the page, that alt text is then read aloud for that user or rendered as braille um, so that they can understand the context of the image within the site uh, or within say a social media post. It's also displayed in place of an image when the image doesn't load or loads too slowly um, 
this is a really good example where some people might have data roaming on and there's features in data roaming where you can turn off loading images just for the sake of not using up too much da data for those individuals. And in that case, uh, even if they're not using a screen reader, it's really helpful for them to see the alt text because then they can also have the context of the image on the page, how it's appearing. And lastly, alt text is used by search engine crawlers to help contextualize things on the page. So when we think about search engines like Google, Google is constantly scrolling through images. Um, images themselves account for around 22.6% of all Google searches that are happening online. And specifically with Google, when it's coming across an image. Uh, there are AI algorithms that are trying to sort through what these images are to best provide that content for users. And so when it comes across an image and that image doesn't have alt text, it might assume something about that image. But when you provide the alt text upon an image, Google uses that to then index it and let people know exactly kind of what images they should be seeing. So if I'm writing alt text and I'm saying there's a black cat in this image, and then I go on Google and search for images of black cats uh, on Google image searches, it's going to pull up similar things within the alt text. Um, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to provide a quick example um, that uh, to represent why alt text is so important. Um, well, one thing to remember also is that this is a this is a free resource. This is something that you can do today. Um, and, and monetarily, it costs nothing. I do recognize it It takes a little bit of time, um, but it can have a major impact on the audience that you're trying to reach. So I work very closely with a very um, wonderful and exceptional museum in Ohio that has a very small staff. And I did an accessibility training with them a few years ago. Um, and uh, they were really great to work with and we continued to partner in lots of ways. And then I presented with them at a conference a few years later and we were talking about, um, you know, the things we've done to encourage accessibility um, uh, moving forward. And this, this museum who the curator was also creating social media posts. So that should give you a sense of like the size of the museum and resources that they have shared this wonderful story, how immediately following our training, she had begun incorporating alt text into her social media posts and had probably been doing it for a year or two when she got an email from a constituent who said, I just wanted to thank you personally for including alt text in your social media posts. I love what you do as a museum. I love artwork, um, but I have low vision and it's really tricky for me to access things online. But because you always include alt text into your social media, I feel like I'm part of your community and I feel like no, I am. Um, I know what's happening at your space. And that testimony was just so powerful for that museum to receive. Um, and it only encouraged them to continue to do alt text moving forward. So even if people aren't sending you wonderful emails, please know that what you are doing is affecting audience. And so when we're thinking about how to create kind of those moments for our audiences, like I'm going to get into a little bit of how to actually create the alt text, how to write it. I recommend keeping your alt text to around 125 characters of text. This is in order to accommodate for the limitations of popular screen readers like JAWS. Um, and when writing your alt text, you want to keep these things in mind. It should be concise and in full sentences. And when thinking about the alt text, avoid using things like image of or graphic of. Um, we don't need to repeat those kind of instances in our alt text. However, since a lot of us are art people here, um, if the medium is relevant to the image, you could say painting of or screen print of. At the WEX, we have lots of different artworks. So when I'm trying to describe something that is a sculpture or a painting, I'm making those distinctions within my alt text um, at the beginning. So the user understands kind of the context of the image and how they're beginning to think about the description that follows, especially since we're more of an art focused account. Um, this goes the same thing for film. I might say film still of and then go into it um, if it's very apparent that is a film still. Um, you also want to make sure that you write in present tense with an active voice. Um, don't do anything with passive voice, mostly because it often leads to more words, which means you have less characters to use in your alt text to provide accurate descriptions. You want to write in affirmations rather than negations. When I mean this, in terms of affirmations rather than negations, say what is 
visible within the photo. Don't say that what is missing. So I'm currently not wearing a hat today. I wouldn't describe that I'm not wearing a hat within my alt text. You also want to focus on the details that best best convey the image and priority of visual information. Um, you know, if there's a person running in a park, I might not describe the blades of grass that are like overlooking the pathway. I'm really focused on the runner. Um, and you just want to make sure that it, it kind of comes into a bit of where is my eye drawn in the image? Um, what is the image that I'm taking um, most often? And also if you need references, you can oftentimes go on Google and inspect the photos and see the alt text of those images as well. You can see people are mostly focusing on, or should be, the main parts of an image that are most important. And lastly, when we're thinking about acronyms in our alt text, uh, try to spell things out like USA. Um, so it would be U hyphen S hyphen A um, so that it doesn't say things like USA. Some screen readers might encounter acronyms and they just phonetically say it out loud. Uh, and so it's better to be mindful about uh, how a screen reader might encounter your content. Um, don't try to abbreviate things in your alt text, try to spell things out, and just anticipate the confusions that a screen reader might create when it's encountering your content with alt text. Lastly, I think it's important to answer kind of these three questions, which is why is this image here? What information is it presenting? And really what purpose does it fulfill? So I have some examples on screen of where to find alt text specifically for Facebook and Instagram. Um, before I kind of dive into those videos, I do want to say that it is really important for us as users when we're on social media to provide the alt text. So um, it's really on social media, it's kind of a, a user-based accessibility model where the platforms themselves aren't providing us the accessibility for our posts. It's really up to us to do it. And so in 2023, there was a report that came out across Twitter, and there was an index of images on Twitter, and they found that 0.06% of images on Twitter had alt text. So really, we need to start doing better about providing the alt text on our images because that means that that entirety of that platform becomes inaccessible for individuals who use screen readers and who would want to see that content. And I think um, it starts to get into a little bit of communal building. How can we um, create community online on our social media platforms? And the more individuals that are doing alt text, the more we're doing it on our personal lives, on our personal feeds. Uh, I do alt text on my personal feeds. I go on a vacation, all my images in my carousel, I have 10 images in the carousel, I'm writing all text for all of them. Um, really just creates and fosters a, a community of sex accessibility online. Are you ready, Austin? Yes. So yeah. we're going to start off with Facebook here on the Facebook video. And so you can see my screen. I'm going to go to the Wexner Center for the Arts page, and I'm going to create a post that's going to have a photo in it. And so I'm going to go in, I'm going to insert my photo. I'm going to see what I want. Don't look at my file structure. Um, <laughs> and then I've pulled up this image of Sambi Zanga, which is one of the films what we're screening with our exhibitions. Um, I'm going into and finding the alt text. I hit the edit button and it expands this window. And this is where you can kind of add that alt text in. Make sure as soon as you do this, you hit save and that alt text should now be attached to the image. So you're free to make your caption for the post. I always like to do this first, so I don't forget. Are you ready for the next? I'm ready. So now we're on Instagram. So you're gonna hit the little plus in the middle of the bottom and you're gonna go and find an image that works for you. Um, so in this instance, I have a bunch of students in our galleries visiting and I can write my caption, do however I want. I can, you know, butts with the features of my post. And then I can go to uh, advanced settings. That's really where you're going to want to look. And then you're going to want to scroll all the way to the bottom, unfortunately, and click the write alt text uh, button. From there, you can add your alt text in. Once you're finished, you can click done. And now the alt text is attached to your Instagram image. Um, you can go back, continue to edit your post and then go ahead and post your content. 
Um, before we move on, um, there's this really great example uh, online of an image description and how this works. So when we're talking about alt text, we're talking about a shorter form. Um, but for image descriptions, we're really thinking about something that's a little bit longer. You can consider putting them into the captions of your Facebook or Instagram posts. And for many of these, I suggest um, not writing you know, novels, but uh, sizable paragraphs that have uh, more expanded descriptions than you might do in your alt text. When thinking about your image descriptions, um, I really think it's a good idea to organize your description, thinking about how it would best make sense to a user. You want to make sure that you're orientating the reader, so where things are in the image, including colors and size, avoiding confusing words and jargon, and just make sure that all of your descriptions are without any kind of inherent bias when you're doing so. So for the next part, a uh, picture in your mind's eye, um, this description, this came out of, uh, you might be able to kind of guess what this might be, but this came out of a, a platform, uh, a notable uh, government organization, and they had these really great images to share and they wanted people to see them. And so they created these really great image descriptions and attached them to the image. So just picture in your mind's eye, um, this image description. It is a photograph that is divided horizontally by an undulating line between a cloudscape, forming a nebula along the bottom portion and a comparatively clear upper portion. Speckled across both portions is a star field, showing innumerable stars of many sizes. The smallest of these are small, distant, faint points of light, and the largest of these appear larger, closer, brighter, and more fully resolved with eight-point diffraction spikes. The upper portion of the image is bluish and has wispy, translucent, cloud-like streaks rising from the nebula below. The orangish, cloudy formation in the bottom half varies in density and ranges from translucent to opaque. The stars vary in color, the majority of which have a blue or orange hue. The cloud-like structure of the nebula contains ridges, peaks, and valleys, an appearance very similar to a mountain range. Three long diffraction spikes from the top right edge of the image suggest the presence of a large star just out of view. So picture that in your mind, and then we'll go ahead and go on to the image. So this is the image that was being described. Um, hopefully it is what you pictured. I think it's a really great description of ways that we can use image descriptions online. This was coming out of the new images of the James Webb Telescope and NASA's account on Twitter actually used image descriptions to better provide um, what people might be encountering. And I really appreciated the alt text uh, or the image descriptions for these incoming images because I started to learn things about the image that I didn't even know was there. And I didn't realize that there was a large three point diffraction spike of a star just out of view in the top right until I looked for it. And so I think it's a really great example of how image descriptions, not just for people who are using screen readers who might need them, um, how people can benefit from the image descriptions that we're putting online. So now we kind of get into the social media specific aspects. Um, hashtags are kind of a unique case to social, I would say. Um, in this instance, you know, I don't know if you still use hashtags on your platforms. I sometimes do. So I always think it's really great to talk about them. Many hashtags seen on social media are all written in lowercase. And so these multi-word hashtags are difficult to discern for screen readers to split them apart. So how do we kind of fix this model? Um, we can use camel case or Pascal case, uh, otherwise known as title case, um, in order to accommodate for screen readers. So camel case is when the first word in the set is lowercase and the following words are capital case. In this instance, I have hashtag the Ohio State University um, with the in a lowercase. Um, and for Pascal case or title case, that's when all the words in the set are capitalized. In this instance, hashtag the Ohio State um, with the the uh, in title case. And um, just just so we don't forget to mention it, the function of the hashtag. Sometimes people use hashtags to find uh, other posts that are similar to what they 
or hashtagging, is that the word? <laughs> and um, so the function still works the same, even if you are using title case or Pascal case. case. Um, and also sometimes people call this camel backing, which I realize is like related to um, like, uh, there's like a water bottle that's a, <laughs> but that has that same, same name, but also sometimes people use that term. I've heard it. Um, hot tip, what we wanted to share with you in terms of thinking about capitalizing, you can also use this beyond social handles. Um, this can be really helpful, um, when you are writing out your email address. So if you are like my, if your email address is similar to mine, where you have multiple words, um, Megan at artpossibleohio.org, I always write that out with capitalizing, uh, capitalizing art possible in Ohio. So that is easier to read and more likely easier for someone to memorize. And then the same thing applies to websites. You can also capitalize your websites that again, at a glance makes it much easier to read. So I have this really um, kind of funny, maybe wasn't funny at the time for individuals moment that happened on Twitter. Um, and so there was a point where a hashtag started going very viral and it was hashtag now Thatcher is dead. So Margaret Thatcher had passed away. And because that had similar characters to now that Cher is dead, uh, there was a lot of people panicking, freaked out, going to the viral uh, hashtag thinking that Cher had passed away and were very upset by this. And um, so this is just an instance of where you can also provide clarity when you're camel casing or Pascal casing your hashtags to make sure that confusions like this doesn't happen. Um, there's a lot of kind of funny examples over time. You can always Google them. Um, but I think this one just kind of sums it up. Absolutely. So emojis, I think this is another like really social media heavy uh, topic because we use emojis a lot on social media. I see so many emojis when I encounter social media content. Um, so it's really important to know with emojis that every emoji actually has a specific description that is read aloud by the screen reader. And these descriptions can be different across platforms. So in the example I have below, I have a string of emojis and that will read something like sun behind, small clouds, sparkles, water waves, smiling face with sunglasses, palm tree. So in case you wanna make sure that your audience with screen readers won't encounter sun behind small cloud, sparkles, water waves, smiley face with sunglasses, palm tree every time um, they try to go to your post, it's always good to minimize the amount of emojis that you're using and putting emojis at the end of phrases. So what do I mean by that? Um, when I'm writing social media content, I'll finish a sentence, put a period, periods create a pause for a screen reader, and then put my emoji afterwards. And I think that helps um, avoid the confusion when we're thinking about emojis on our platforms. There's a really great um, website called emojipedia.org. And it's actually a place where you can go, you can look up the emoji meanings. Um, it's I find it really helpful too, to understand some of the cultural contexts of emojis. So certain emojis are created that we might just go, oh, this looks like a, kind of a related image to what I'm doing, but we might not understand that the emoji is created for a cultural context. And I think it's really helpful to uh, look at that ahead of time when you're creating your content, just to make sure that you're being respectful to any of those kind of cultural emojis um, and thinking about how it might read for a screen reader. In certain instances, you can kind of play with this. There's actually an emoji that is an admission ticket. And so whenever I'm talking about admission tickets for the center, I'm oftentimes using that emoji next to when I'm talking about tickets. So it's all kind of related and I know how it's gonna be read aloud. Um, another thing to consider with emojis is just to use them over things like emoticons. When I say emoticons, that's when you do like colon, close parenthesis, and to create a smiley face, that's not going to be accessible for screen readers. And uh, not to put any kind of emojis um, in your usernames, um, that's something that we should just avoid. That way it's not read aloud every time a user is encountering your account, as well as if you're using uh, an organizational account. So if you're posting social media for your organization, it might just be worth to stick to the yellow uh, emoji skin tone when um, using any of those kind of hand emojis. 
um, skin tone customizations not only create additional text in the description of the emoji, so it just makes it longer for the user to encounter, but if we're representing an institution with a variety of people inside of it, um, it's really helpful to um, just make it so that it is a it is a more broad and and um, general kind of emoji use. So now we're going to talk about links. Um, we're really getting into the details of social media here, especially in creating social media copy. When you are linking um, to anything, it's really essential that you contextualize your links. You don't want to just say click here because someone who cannot see their screen may not know where here is. So you always want to use directives. So things like to attend our event, please click the following link. To register for tickets, please link the link. Uh, please click the link below. So that person um, who is hovering over your text can immediately find that link to access your program. This is also a really useful tip to um, utilize when you're if you if you also work on your website or if you work with the website team. Um, you want to make sure you contextualize your links there as well. Um, if you put any buttons on your website, the buttons need to say. Um, their function. So click here to purchase tickets, but then right next to that button, you also need to have the direct link because some screen readers won't pick up that text on the button or um, their screen reader won't let them click on that, that button in order to access that web page. So for the instances of social media, social media doesn't allow us to create buttons, I wish it did, or hyperlink text. Um, so how do we kind of get around that? Um, it's really uh, difficult and annoying for a screen reader to encounter a very long string link that appears on social media. So instead, I would always recommend using shortening link tools like um, Bitly in order to share your links on social media. And so in this example, um, I have I have two examples, actually. I have one that is wexarts.info um, slash real abilities. So I'm pulling in that camel case that we learned about with hashtags as well, thinking about how the screen reader is going to encounter that short link. Um, and then I have an example of a post to the right. Um, this is about Jeff Parker, who's coming to the center. And so when I was thinking about this post, um, I was really looking at uh, having kind of two links. So certain platforms do something what is called like a link preview or a thumbnail when you post a link to the platform. That's when it's pulling an image through with the link. In this one, you can see Jeff Parker's kind of headshot that is pulling through from the website. And in my testing of this, I found that some of the platforms used to be able to pull the alt text with the image. So if the alt text was on your image on the website, it would pull the alt text along with the image to the image thumbnail. I found that to be less consistent in recent years, especially with X um, and certain platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn. It's kind of a 50-50. And so I recommend kind of using a solution if it's an image that maybe is non-decorative. Um, when I say decorative images, it's something that we don't really need to describe. It's just like there to, you know, fill space on a page. It's not... Um, useful in any kind of context. In this instance, I think it is useful in a context because it is an image of Jeff Parker. I recommend using something like a link preview. And so in this, I've pulled the alt text from the image and that appears at the end of my post right before a user might encounter that image so that they can see what the alt text of that image is going to be before they click through on it. Um, and in this instance, I've contextualized um, my short link as well. So I edit the back end of my short links through Bitly to make sure that an individual clicking on it will understand that it's they're going to learn more at wexarts.info and it's going to be about performing arts 2024. Um, certain services like Bitly do cost. So I recommend um, looking into your variety of options. I, this is the one that I prefer the best. And it was actually something that I was able to go to my institution and write that into our budget to say, I need this for the accessibility that's happening on our social media and get that as a tool for me. So when considering language, when you're writing copy um, for your social media posts, it's really important to stick to a fourth to sixth grade reading level. Sometimes that's called a lexicon. Um, 
There's a recent statistic that states that 50 per, 54% of adults in the U.S. are below a sixth grade reading level. So we want to be making sure that everybody can access the language that we're using as arts organizations. Sometimes we do get excited about art terms um, and things like that. Um, if you want to use them, you definitely need to make sure that you're defining them in the text as well. Um, but we want to discourage you from really probably using them all uh, at all because we want to make sure that everybody can, um, you know, when we're reading on social media, we're reading quickly. Um, we make sure they can grab the information that they need very quickly and in a concise way. Um, be as clear as you possible. When you're posting, use appropriate spacing. We don't want a big block of text whenever possible. Um, we want to have lots of appropriate spacing so that people um, can easily see um, where the event is, what time it is, how to register for it, what the description is, and so forth. And make sure you always put the need to know information at the top, which is just what I described. What is the event? Where is it? How can I get there? And then if you want to talk more about the program itself in depth, include a bio of the person coming and running the program, you may do so at the bottom of the text. Um, but when a screen reader is reading that text out loud, um, that's what they're going to be grabbing first. And so we want to make sure that that most essential information is being put forth. Um, another thing to consider is to be mindful of your punctuation and formatting when you're using it in your writing. This is uh, for every bit of digital content as we're thinking about how screen readers might encounter it. Comma or periods are representing a pause for the screen reader. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, you can utilize these actually to create clarity for screen readers as well. Um, I've found that, you know, when I'm using more commas and periods, it's just better for everyone, right? So we just want to make sure that we know that those are representing a pause. Thinking about spelling out days of the week, some screen readers might not read the abbreviations of our weeks as the um, days of the week. It just depends on the settings of that screen reader. When we're thinking about screen readers, we need to understand that they're kind of customized to the user. So it's not a, a, a global kind of rule for everything. We're just trying to hit the most clarity we possibly can at any given point. And thinking about av avoiding unnecessary punctuation. I have an image on the right, actually, that shows how this appears for a screen reader, potentially. There's a computer screen and it has one plus one equals two on it. And so that screen reader in the little text bubble, it appears, would read one, one, two. It would not read the plus sign or the equal sign. So it's just um, something to keep in mind. Say I was posting, if I'm thinking about alt text in this instance, I'm posting an image that has one plus one equals two on it. I would like to spell out one plus one equals two. Um, a really good tool that you can use when thinking about your reading level is the Hemingway app editor. This is a free tool online. Um, you can just Google it. This is also a great time to mention that we will have some resources that we can share um, after the presentation. The Hemingway app editor is mm -hmm. kind of like a Grammarly if individuals are familiar with that platform. And you can put your text through, you can copy paste, and it will highlight different sections to let you know um, where your reading level might be getting higher or um, in our instances when we're dealing with exhibitions, it might start to get into a graduate level. So we need to make sure that we're um, editing that language down and, and making it accessible for people. There's another level to all of this when it comes to writing your copy for your socials. And that is avoiding ableist language. So ableist language, you can probably assume what it is, but it's any word or phrase that devalues people who have a disability. For example, um, we would never want to write um, copy that sometime, that someone is suffering or afflicted with a disability. Those are pretty derogatory terms to use when we're talking about disabilities. You just want to, if you are even identifying that they have a disability, you want to say someone with a disability. Um, we always want to use people first language, keeping in mind individuals with disabilities may identify themselves differently, however they choose to. And then we always want to avoid what we call inspiration porn, which is this idea that an individual with a disability is inspiring despite or because of their disability. So obviously anyone can be inspiring. Um, lots of art is very inspiring, but using disability as a prop for it is incredibly disrespectful to that individual's humanity.
So now we're going to start to get into graphic design when we're thinking about our social media. So I understand um, that uh, a lot of institutions, you might be um, sharing the role of the social media coordinator or, you know, you're diving into Canva um, to, to create graphics for your organization. So how does it look when we're thinking about graphic design and accessibility on our platforms? When designing for social media and in general, um, it's an impossible task to try and make one design for every need to have all of these different versions. So instead, we want to focus on a universal design that everyone can receive and enjoy. When making your content, you can also think about cross-posting to other platforms. So if certain communities are more likely to be on one platform than another, you can make sure that you're not excluding a certain group by, say, just posting on Instagram if you also have a Facebook. Perhaps the users on Facebook are just a different audience and you need to reach them as well. When we're thinking about design specifically, um, there's a few kind of breakdowns. One of them is contrast. So uh, in accordance with the web content accessibility guidelines um, for uh, AA standards, text should have a 4.5 to 1 difference against a background. Uh, in this instance, there are checkers out there. You can use like a tool to check the contrast of your background um, in order to make sure that it's within that 4.5 to 1 ratio. You want to make sure that you're avoiding using text over images. If you are using text over images, we found that a really great tool to help create that contrast is creating a drop shadow behind that text. It separates it out from the background and makes sure that you can darken the image around it. Don't just rely on colors to solely convey meaning either. When we're thinking about things like colorblindness, we want to also think about shapes um, when we're designing something uh, with color. And checking the contrast between colors and avoiding colors that create strobe effects. Sometimes things like a, a vibrant red and a green or certain other colors will create this kind of strobing effect. And that is hard to see on the eyes. So we just want to make sure that we're avoiding that in general. When thinking about color, you can actually head to color.adobe.com. And color.adobe.com has, I think it's a really great tool. It has uh, accessibility features on the website. And they actually have, if you're thinking about from the very beginning, your color palette for a certain design. You can go on there. You can actually check your color palette for different types of color blindness to see if it's accessible or not. And as you're creating your color palette, it will actually flag things to say, well, you have these colors and they look different, but for a certain type of color blindness, these will start to appear the same. So just be mindful of that. And in the image on the right, you can kind of see this in action between the different colors. There's a gold and a yellow, which is not common contrasting uh, a blue and like a teal that's not contrasting but this blue and yellow are fitting within the 4.5 to 1 guidelines so to speak when thinking about your font you just want to make sure that your font has enough weight to it so that it contrasts with the background thin fonts really narrow fonts um, might be difficult to read, especially if they're over images. Uh, we encounter this with our own kind of font style. So it's always good to see how you can um, create, use font that it's a little bit bolder. We have different types of font in our kind of design portfolio. We'll use kind of a bolder font to help separate that out, right? Um, you also want to make sure that you avoid dainty or swirling fonts that are difficult to read, those script ones, and try avoid putting it in italics. It's often also more difficult to read when font is in italics as well. When thinking about the fonts, um, make sure to utilize kind of sans serif fonts that help improve readability. Um, I like to also think about if we're designing for like your, what is my social media brand? Um, finding the free fonts that are on everyone's computers. That's also kind of creating a form of accessibility within your institution so everyone can access your brand font, so to speak. These might include Helvetica, Verdana, Futura Bold, Proxima Nova, and Arial. Um, be really mindful of the images that you're using in your social media and how you're sourcing your images. We want to be as inclus inclusive and as authentic as possible. So when we're folks review, as you know, when folks review marketing sources, they often feel more welcome when they see folks like themselves in those images. And in food for thought, if you don't have images that reflect an audience that you seek, does that mean your programs are not including such audiences? 
well, what can you do about this? It seems like the chicken and egg scenario a little bit when we're talking about this specific instance. Um, well, there are stock images that you could use, but they should be noticed, uh, noted as such if you are using a stock image for your marketing. And that certainly may draw some question marks from your audience. Um, you could also invite individuals with disabilities into your spaces um, to be part of an accessibility committee, be part of a program. And you could tell them we would really love to take images of you to include in our marketing because we want people like you in our spaces. And guess what? We're also going to compensate you for this because essentially you're acting as models today. When you're doing this, it can be a really positive thing to note that you're doing this also um, in your marketing when you're pushing it out into the world. It can be a learning tool for other people, but it's also just helpful to call out what you're doing. Transparency, transparency like this is really key because that highlights your organizational values and your intentions to be more inclusive space. So now we kind of get into what not to do on our social media platforms. And one of these is kind of a trend that I think revives every so often, every few years. It's this funky text trend. So there's all these funky text generators out there. Um, you might have seen them before where it's a way for people to kind of create different fonts on their social media posts that the platform might not allow. But actually, this is not accessible to screen readers. And I have an example. Um, this tweet, actually, um, this is what this tweet sounds like to a screen reader directly. Edit text. New mathematical sans are italic small t. Mathematical sans are italic small h. Mathematical sans are italic small one. Mathematical sans are italic small in. Mathematical sans are so I'm going to pause that because that starts to get really annoying very quickly. And it would be as well for a screen reading user. So just be mindful that when you're using funky text, you just want to avoid it in general. It's not accessible. It's using special characters to kind of um, hack the system, so to speak. And so it's just something that we don't want to be using on our social media feeds. We also want to avoid using inaccessible trends like ASCII art or two column posts. When I say ASCII art, I mean like using emoticons to create images on the right. I have an example of a bunny holding a sign that says don't use ASCII art in tweets, um, using all of these kind of characters to create it. When we're thinking about ASCII art, it's also a trend that kind of comes back every once in a while. Uh, rather than hopping on the trend, you might be able to instead uh, take a screenshot of the ASCII art that you created, post it as an image, provide alt text with the image. So that way we still see the ASCII art, but it's something that everyone can enjoy. Also thinking about two column posts. Sometimes I've seen tweets where it's two different columns. That screen reader is not going to differentiate between one column or the other, it's going to read across the columns and that'll create some confusion. And lastly, we want to avoid things like mixed case. That's kind of like the mocking text I've seen on social media before where you're using capitalization and lowercase and sometimes numbers to stand in for letters. That screen reader is not going to be able to differentiate that into the words that we might be viewing. Um, I expect I specifically want to highlight uh, Instagram stories or Facebook stories too here because this is even quicker way that people are trying to access social media um, and not just for folks who are using screen readers, but for aging eyes, it is really important that these stories are accessible. It's a very finite amount of time that you're trying to access them for this information people tend to love to italicize text um, in Instagram and Facebook stories for some reason. Um, if you're ital italicizing text, it can be really hard to read the uh, read that that copy um, that's trying to come through and any kind of fun text. The same principles apply for stories. Um, don't go too hex text heavy in stories and make sure that you're using the, those contrasting colors whenever you can, whether you're providing a contrasting background or a really bold text in a very um, contrasting color so that it's easier to read um, and people just don't skip past it. So now we start to think about video content on our platforms. Video has kind of become a really central aspect of social media. And when we're thinking about video, we just want to be mindful of creating captions with our video content. So what is that? Captions are textual transcriptions of a video's dialogue, sound effects, and music. Unlike subtitles, which only translate the video's dialogue, captions do not assume that the viewer can hear the audio of the video. 
This is really important when we think about just the general user base of social media as well. 85% of all Facebook videos are watched without sound, at least for the first time. So that's just really something to keep in mind when you're thinking about creating your content. When you create captions with your content, you're actually making it more accessible for everyone, not just the people that uh, need the captions. Uh, when we're thinking about the different platforms, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram all have editable caption features within the platforms. When editing the captions, you just want to make sure that you're checking for the accuracy and readability of um, the font and where it's placed on your video. When we're thinking about accuracy, we want to make sure it's a 99% accuracy. And a um, a full marketing team might be able to use things like Premiere Pro uh, to create captions with SRT files. Those are for platforms like Twitter or LinkedIn. Facebook, you can also, and YouTube, you can also use SRT files to upload those with your video. And that file is just the actual caption file that times out to the video specifically. So you might be able to ask your marketing team for assistance on that front or learn yourself. I learned it myself. It's... Um, it's a process, but there's really helpful tutorial videos out there. Um, oh, go ahead, Austin. Sorry. There's ahead. also uh, really great resources out there when you're thinking about captioning. Um, better than probably what I could describe. Uh, Dr. Tina Childress uh, is a deaf audiologist, um, and she has a really great resources on her website um, about captioning. I kind of just like um, fan over them. They're really great uh, resources to utilize and think about the way that you're captioning. And then when we're thinking about it for social media, there's actually tools like CapCut, Clipomatic, or CapWing that you can pull a video into before you post it. And they can create auto captions for you that you can then edit, add to the video, and then put up as part of the post. If you are really resourceful and way ahead on your social media planning, you can hire captioners too. Um, they'd be pre-recorded clips or videos sent out to a captioner. They send it back to you, bada bing, you're ready to go. No. So we're going to talk a little bit about planning and, and more a little bit more of the why here as we conclude our presentation today. Um, one thing that we want to consider is that access-centered work like this can benefit older aging adults. So when we're thinking about marketing and what we're pushing out digitally, it can be helpful to think about our future selves. We're all aging, and as our bodies get older, some of our sensory functions tend to break down, um, and we may be not able to access things digitally the way we used to. So it can be really helpful to think about that. It can be helpful to think perhaps about a parent um, or a grandparent, um, and if they are able to access your marketing materials that you offer digitally, could your 70-year-old mother effectively access what you are sharing? Or is your marketing for a very specific able-bodied demographic of a very specific age range? Um, so there's a statistic out there that says uh, only 45% of individuals over 65 say that they use social media as opposed to 73% of people who are 50 to 64. So even though Austin and I are here to talk all about digital accessibility in terms of socials, it could be that you need to consider different kinds of marketing for um, an older aging, um, an older aging group who may not be getting um, these online materials that you're working so hard on. Ask yourself who may not see this. And finally, um, access uh, is, a, we, 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 I'm getting a little caught up here, forgive me. <laughs> so one of the principles that we really love to push forward at Art Possible Ohio, and I know Austin really believes in, is this concept of access as an aesthetic. Um, this is access as an action, as a verb. Um, we ask you to consider access, which includes inter intersectional identity. We ask that you consider access at all levels of your space and programs and policies, marketing, pro collections, unearthing and sharing hidden stories, hiring directors, staff, volunteers um, with disabilities, and providing the tools and resources they need to grow as professionals and be successful in the work that they do. We ask that you think about access at the beginning of the work that you do and not the end. That's really what we're promoting here today. What can you do now rather than adding something to all the hard work that you've already done? 
this is really a mind shift. Changing bias, altering systems is a mind shift. And so required to change all the work that you do. It means letting go of things you believe are integral to positive arts experiences or user experiences. But if you can keep the why of access at the forefront of what you do, those losses will not carry so much weight. Ultimately, we believe that this kind of access is beautiful. Consider access as your aesthetic. I think that is all we really have for you today. We know it's a whole lot of information. Um, we absolutely understand that. Um, but we do have some great resources that Austin has compiled that I believe we are going to send out following the power, uh, this presentation along with the PowerPoint deck. However, if you want to contact Austin and I at any point, these are our email addresses. We're pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, give us a day or two to get back to you busy just like you all are um, but we'd love to hear from you and love to point you in a positive direction moving forward austin do you have anything else you wanted to add today um just that one of the resources that'll be sent out will be a kind of social media checklist that you can use for you or your institutions to audit your accounts you can go through it's pretty self-explanatory it covers basically everything that we touched upon today and we, you can make sure that you can um, incorporate that into your social media process. I really recommend building a plan around this. There's a guide actually attached to the checklist of how to do this. And thinking about not just doing all of this at once, because we are human and we have time in the day and we have time to learn. So just thinking about one or two things that you can start to incorporate now and then building it out week by week until you become a social media accessibility pro. Great. Thank you so much, Megan and Austin. That was a lot of really important, really wonderful information. A lot to digest here. There's a lot of excitement over the additional resources. And yes, I want to reiterate, we will send out those resources along with a copy of the slide deck and the recording. Um, if not tomorrow, definitely by Monday. So you can look forward to all of that. We do have quite a few questions. I realize we are um, up on our hour here, but if Austin and Megan don't mind sticking around, maybe for another 10 to 15 minutes to try and move through some of these questions, we'd love to have everyone who can stay on continue to join us as well. Are you two up for that? Sure. All right, let's go. So. Uh, First, a couple of folks were asking about if you use platforms for scheduling posts, like Meta Business or something like that, is there a way to enter alt text in there that, that would then apply across platforms or uh, go into the scheduled posts? Yes. So I use Sprout Social, which I recognize is maybe the pricier end for a lot of individuals. And that gives me opportunity to put in alt text on some platforms images. So for Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, I can do that within the Sprout Social platform. But for things like Instagram, I have to go to the app itself to add in my alt text when I'm posting. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, it's not consistent for every one of those platforms. I know for um, Meta Business, it might be for Facebook, but I haven't seen uh, if there is a feature for Instagram, if it carries over actually when you're posting. Um, I did see someone's specific um, social media posting tool, which was... Um, Agora Pulse. I yeah, think. Agora Pulse. Yeah. They do have an alt text feature. I looked it up actually, and I'll I'll put in the support link in the chat of how you can add that to your um, platform. Great, thank you. Oh, thanks, Austin. All right, so next, you let's talk a little bit more about um, screen readers. I think there's a lot of curiosity around screen readers. We don't always, for those of us who don't use them, we don't always understand how that translates. You had that slide that showed the example of one plus one equals two and the screen reader not reading those symbols. Is it all symbols like that? Do you have a list of the symbols that it wouldn't read? Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, so it's case by case with the symbols. Um, some symbols are read aloud, which is why we don't, we say not to use emoticons, um, because those symbols are getting read by the screen reader. Um, but others like hyphens or dashes are actually being uh, skipped over by the screen reader. 
you can use this actually to your advantage um, when you're thinking about bullets. There's certain symbols you don't want to use and certain symbols that you maybe want to use, um, knowing that the screen reader won't pick those up and it'll just be clear for that user. Um, there are lists out there. I can try to make sure that that's folded into the materials. One of the things that I actually really recommend rather than just looking at a guide is all of us on our phones, um, we have access to a voice to text option that we can use to check our own content. There's also free screen readers out there that you can download on your computer and check your content. I find that to be a really helpful way because when I started diving into writing alt text, trying to make things accessible with the formatting, there were things that I didn't even realize were happening to screen readers until I started testing out my content. You don't have to do this every time, but just as a general rule, maybe take some time, learn how to um, turn on the voice to text button on your phones, um, fair warning. There is a little bit of navigation that is required, like how you navigate it. So maybe look up a tutorial guide before you turn that on um, so you don't end up stuck in your settings like I was when I first did it. Um, and then go ahead and check your content and see how it's doing on the platform. Um, I think that's a really great way to, to see actually formatting. Thank you. Well, sticking with the screen reader theme, you talked a little bit about hashtags and camel case and Pascal case. When a screen reader encounters a hashtag, does it say hashtag well, you know, whatever the hashtag is, does it say pounce? Like, can you talk a little bit about how, what happens when a screen reader encounters a hashtag? Yeah, I don't think it says hashtag from what I understand. Um, and it, again, screen reading users might have certain settings when they're doing the screen reader. So the only thing that I could probably speak to is like the default settings of a screen reader. Um, if a user has decided to turn pound signs off, then um, especially if they're on social a lot of the time, then maybe it might not read that. Um, another thing to consider about screen readers is just that it's kind of tailored really to the user. Um, so if you want to see if that's appearing for you on the default settings, I would say testing out a variety of screen readers to see how that's appearing. Ultimately, same thing with emojis maybe not doing like 20 to 30 hashtags at the end of a post. Um, because ultimately, if a screen reader is reading that for that user, they're going to get pound sign a lot um, within that content. And it just makes it a little bit inaccessible. So I, I think in the same way as we treat emojis, thinking about hashtags, similarly, always putting it at the end of your content um, and always making sure that you're using minimally. I use no more than three. Um, on, on a majority of my posts, sometimes one or none. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, one thing I do want to note about screen reading users is that uh, they're used to a lot of content being in, inaccessible when they're encountering platforms just across media. Um, so one of the things that's really important to consider is that they might at any given time tab through the content. And by mean, what I mean by tab is that they might hit tab and their screen reading screen reader will just end that sentence and move on to the next one or move on to the next bit of content that their navigation goes to. Um, so thinking about front loading your content with the most important information at the beginning. Um, so that way, if a screen reading user is encountering it, they're going to see it first, and they might not have the opportunity to tab out of your content before they reach the really crucial stuff. I try to put dates and things for our events towards the beginning for this purpose. All right, let's hop over to uh, alt text and image descriptions for a minute. Lots of questions about those. So um, can you talk a little bit more about alt text versus image descriptions, where might you put an image description? Obviously the alt text is tied to an image. When you're when you're writing your image description, where might that appear? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, Megan has, uh, from Art Possible's account actually has really great examples, I think, of the differences between where you put the alt text and where you put the image descriptions. Um, I don't use image descriptions as much for the Wexner Center for the Arts feeds um, just because I've 
found that some of the images that we're sharing might not need to be expanded upon more than say alt text needs to be. Um, but I think Art Possible has really great examples of where to put the image descriptions. It's always included below at the end of the caption. It'll say, um, you know, image description to let you know that before you're getting to that bit of content, it is the image description for the image. And then their alt text is attached to the image um, as part of that social media post. Yeah, and I think sometimes what happens is um, arts or organizations that have fewer resources, they tend to default and put in image descriptions because, because they found for workflow, um, it's easier for them to just include it with the copy. Now the preferences to have both, but we've also had feedback from users that it doesn't really matter as long as there's one or the other, um, then it allows them to access what, you know, what the image is. So it's really, ideally, you could do both. I would say alt text first, um, but we do understand that workflow wise, um, it might be simpler to just put the ID in at the bottom of the, the copy that you're providing. When you're thinking about your content, content on social media, I, I think it's also really important to consider um, how, like, if you're a user of a screen reader, like, when would you want to encounter the description of the image? And when we're dealing with alt text, that description is attached to the image. So think about Instagram when you're scrolling through. The first thing you see is the profile and the handle of the profile and then the image. So as a screen reading user, I might not want to wait for the description of the image all the way past my description. So attaching alt text and image descriptions, if you're able to do so, is a really helpful way to make sure that screen reading users get that bit of content to con contextualize the caption below first. That was really helpful in making that distinction. Thank you both. Um, Austin, you talked a little bit about, you had the slide where you were showing that sample LinkedIn post and you had talked about how sometimes alt text comes over with the image when you're bringing it in. Sometimes it doesn't, It's you, you kind of don't know. How do you check that when you bring your image in and see if, there's alt, if the alt text came over? This is um, something that I've checked after I've posted using a screen reader. Screen reader. Um, I can say with fair certainty that right now, um, it used to be that Twitter would pull the alt text with the image. Um, with the new platform of X, that no longer happens. And so um, I would just assume whenever you're having a thumbnail on X that it's not pulling the alt text. I've found similar results from Facebook. And so I think it's more helpful to, if if you don't want to go back and check your post to see, is it pulling this alt text or not, um, to, if it's an image that you're linking through and it's pulling that thumbnail and it's non-decorative, and it's something that's really important to the con context of that link, to just describe the alt text before that image for that user. Um, and it's really simple because if, if that alt text is already on your website, um, if you know how to like right click and inspect a uh, image uh, and it pulls up the, all that really scary code, um, it'll actually highlight it for you that there's all text on the image and you can just copy paste that out of there. Um, there's some really helpful tutorials um, and I'm happy to send a um, like a screenshot of what that looks like. I use that on our Wexner Center for the Arts accounts a lot. Whenever there's alt text attached to an image and then I wanna post that image, I just use the inspect tool, pull out the alt text and then attach it again. Fantastic. Okay, so we are coming up here on our 15 minutes. If we did not get to your question, don't worry. I have all the questions saved here. We will follow up with you offline. We'll make sure you get an answer. I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. Really appreciate you all taking the time to tune in today and make this effort to be more accessible and open to more folks. Um, it kind of touches back on what Megan mentioned in the beginning, that curb cut effect where this benefits everyone. This is, this is something that we should all be doing. And I've learned some really great tips here. I'm sure everyone else has too. So thank you, Megan and Austin, for taking the time to be here and share your knowledge with us. Again, we will share those resources that Austin was referring to, a copy of the slide deck and a link to the recording uh, by Monday at the latest with all of you. So that does it for now. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Megan or Austin? Good. All right. All right. 
Well, that does it for today. Thank you all so much for joining us and we hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot.